Thank you. Quite the introduction. All right, guys. We're, I'm, yeah, thank you for bearing with me. This is the second last talk of the conference. Um, so I'm glad you guys are here. I totally thought nobody was going to be here at this point. Um, and we're going to talk about getting expressive with React.js. Uh, the title of this talk was totally a shout out to Olivia Newton-John and Let's Get Physical. Um, but I don't think it came across. The word expressive just doesn't have that like ring to it. Um, but expressive, like, what does that even mean? I feel like I've heard a lot of people talking about it over the past few years, saying one thing's more expressive than something else. And uh, when, I, when I signed up to do the talk and um, you know, said I was going to talk about React and, and being expressive with it, I had really had to take a step back and be like, like do I even know what this means? Um, Beyonce knows what it means. She's like the most ex expressive lady ever. Like, just look at her. She's incredible. <laughs> so let's start off by defining expressive. Um, so, you know, I went to my old pal dictionary.com and I looked up expressive, like you would, and uh, it gave me a whole bunch of definitions, none of which were very helpful. Um, full of expression, meaningful, serving to express, Concerned with expression. All right, so it like really wants me to get into expression. Um, so I started looking at uh, the definitions of expression and then eventually express. And express like was even more weird. Um, there's something about like you can like squeeze grapes and that's called like expressing grapes. And I was like, all right, that's like kind of cool, but not what I'm looking for. So I did a little bit more investigation, got a little deeper. Um, and I'm going to tell you guys what expressive means. But first, we have to start with express and forms of expression. And of course, human expression, we got this one for free the second we were born. Um, if somebody's sad, if somebody's happy, if somebody's shocked, if somebody's surprised, we can tell it just by looking at them. It's pretty powerful. And then there's expression of the mind, so thinking about ink. And, uh, you know, like early cave painters like, have totally told us stories and um, expressed like, things that they were going through. And, and expressionist painters do this today, and we do it in all kinds of art forms. And ink brings us to images. And we're in like, a pretty interesting time right now because like, a friend can send you dancing girls, and you basically know exactly what that means. It's like, let's hang out, or like, let's go dancing at the club. That's how I like, perceive it. And like, that's pretty powerful. That's just like a little character. And that's gotten even crazier, because now we have Bitmoji. And that's mine. Um, and I can like, basically fire off one of these little images to my friends. And it can mean a lot of things, like up to a sentence worth of information. And actually, just this weekend, I saw this like, My Idol thing. And that is so horrifying. Oh my god. Like, that's like an, an entirely other form of expression. And then if we think about text, I mean, text is kind of crazy. Uh, if you look at Markdown with a little bit of syntax, you can basically style and parse uh, text. So you can like, look at something and know what a header is versus like an H2, versus a list, versus like something bold. Um, so yeah, expression takes all kinds of different forms. Um, but what about JavaScript? Well, let's talk about that. So I started looking up expressive programming languages. And dictionary.com just wasn't doing it for me, so I went to my next best BFF, Wikipedia. I was like, what do you think about this? And eventually I found this article called Expressive Power, which did not seem like it would be expressive programming languages, but apparently that's exactly what it is. In fact, the first line reads, um, in computer science, the expressive power, also called expressiveness or expressivity, of a language is the breadth of ideas that can be represented and communicated in that language. Now, if you read the rest of the Wikipedia article, it like breaks down real fast. Like this is like one of these Wikipedia articles that like somebody threw up and a bunch of other people like chipped in on, and it's like kind of just not all there. So Wikipedia, like kind of a disappointment. So then I just started like going on a rampage Google search. I'm like, what even like, is expressive programming languages? Like, help me. And eventually, I found this, this article by D. Burkholz, um, where he basically analyzed um, what the most like, expressive programming languages were by using a large data set of commits. Um, and then he wrote this like, really great post about it. And there's a ton of information here. And I just kind of like, took a bit off the surface. 
Um, so the proxy that he used was he looked at how many lines of code changed in each commit. Because if you could look at um, what a language enabled you to do in a certain amount of space, you could potentially like, determine the expressiveness of that language. So yeah, he ran a bunch of studies. He's awesome and smart. Um, he came up with these three as being the most expressive by analy analyzing the data set that he had. So Clojure, CoffeeScript, Haskell. And CoffeeScript specifically makes sense because the language is written for that purpose, to be a more expressive form of JavaScript. And then I wasn't like still 100% convinced, so I basically shared out this, this drawing to the community of, of 53. I work at 53. And I said, what does the word expressive mean to you? And I got back some more answers. So this little kid, I, I actually personally know him. He's like my coworker's like, like young cousin. He said, the word expressive means what you feel on the inside is shown. So it's kind of like the human emotion definition. Somebody else drew a bunch of emoji. I was like, OK, the images. And then somebody else replied with this really beautiful um, drawing and then said, to me, something is expressive when it does not need a long explanation. You just get it somehow, no matter how simple or complex. And taking that a step further, I think we can look at exp expressiveness as ease of readability and understanding and ease of use and application. So like, how does that even fit into React? Let's talk about that. Um, let's look at expressiveness by framework expressiveness by tools, and expressiveness in server and beyond. So starting off with framework, um, how many of you here have used React.js? Cool. That's more than I expected. That's great. I'll keep it fast. So I'm actually going to tell you what it is in 30 seconds, for those of you who don't know. And I'm actually going to do it in three GIFs. So the main principle of React, and the one that I think is the most important, is one-way data flow. Uh, for those of you who are Dragon Ball Z fans, this move is called the Kamehameha, and I had to practice saying that like a million times <laughs> so I wouldn't get it wrong. Um, but they basically take all this energy in, and then they fire it at somebody else, and it's like their most powerful move. But it's fired one way, and you can kind of think of all of your application state as coming into your main entry point of the app and then going all the way down. And then if something changes somewhere that, ch that causes the data to change, that goes back to the top, and then it repeats again. goes all the way down. And then we have the virtual DOM, which is the most popular feature of React, the one that everybody talks about all the time. And, and yeah, the virtual DOM is really cool. It basically has a, a snapshot of the DOM um, as it is currently. And then with any new data, it basically re-renders the entire DOM for your application and compares them. And it says what's different. And it looks at each node. And whenever it finds a dirty node or a dirty section of the tree, then it basically just re-renders that section. And it does it in like the most performant way it knows how. So yeah, this isn't like, this is like pretty novel, I guess, but like, you know, Glimmer is like looking at doing it with streams. And, um, and like Mark showed earlier, um, you know, some of this stuff has been there for a long time. But it's still like a great feature. And then the third one is the view. <laughs> It was actually really hard to find a good GIF for the view, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but I like this one very much. Um, so each, you know, a React component has one main thing that it does, and that's render. And you can think of like a React component as having the view business logic and like the view template together. But React's not going to give you anything to really help you from like a model or a controller perspective. So just think about it as very much like the view side of things. And then before we like really dig into any code or anything, um, yeah, I'm totally using CoffeeScript. True story. Um, so if you see add anywhere, basically it means this dot. Um, if you see a, a skinny arrow or a fat arrow, that's a function. And if you see an underscore, I'm also using Streamline, which is like an async await library. So um, that's what that is. You could basically just think that it, re it replaces callback in, uh, in absolute, absolutely anything. So the very first time a coworker showed me React, uh, I think they showed me this like, to-do list example, which is like the main one on the React page. And um, yeah, I looked at it, and there's a lot going on here. Like, 
I don't know, the, here's this render function and it's doing something with a list item and it's returning that. It's kind of gnarly, like it sort of looks like a templating language, like what is any of this? And I basically was like, no, I'm not interested in doing any of that. We're using Backbone, we're using CoffeeScript, everything's super clean. Um, so I was kind of turned off right away when I saw it. And then over time, we sort of figured out a way to, to simplify it, or kind of come up with a more, I think, like expressive way of writing React components. Um, so basically, we're using CoffeeScript, so it takes away a lot of um, you know, the additives. It becomes pretty clean. Um, React components have a name, which is a display name. State, which is the internal component state. Props, which is that kamihamiha data that's pushed down from the app all the way down. And then render, which is actually rendering the component. So one thing that we're using to get you know, a bit of a cleaner uh, React component is destructuring. So that's, that's been in CoffeeScript since like forever, I'm going to say, since like the beginning of time. I'm not entirely positive, but I'm pretty sure. Um, so basically, you can extract you know, functions and objects from, from like modules and assign them to whatever's on the left-hand side. So React has this function called createFactory. Um, we can basically like pull it out of that and assign it to a variable called create factory. And then from here on then, we just use create factory. And ES6 has the same thing, and it, it totally cleans up your code a ton. If you're not using destructuring, or, or if you haven't made the move, I highly recommend it. It's just, it's kind of like changed the way I write all my code. It's much more clean. And then there's also destructuring assignments. You can actually like pull something out of React, and then you can give it a new name. So in this case, I'm pulling DOM out of React, which has all the DOM components in it, so like DOM.button, DOM.p, DOM.span, and I'm assigning it to D, so that just makes it a little bit cleaner. So it's a little bit weird to read because like, the thing on the right-hand side is like, actually the thing you're assigning it to, but it's, it's cool once you like, get comfortable with it. Just ease into it. And then there's template strings, and this is like one of my favorite things, but in CoffeeScript, um, working with strings, interpolation, multi-line strings, uh, it's just so much easier. Um, we can basically like, I was playing around with the idea of doing like a Drake lyrics React app for this demo, but didn't actually get like the full way. Um, and basically like thinking like, you know, you could have the title of the whole app and you just like pipe that in um, using that syntax up there. And same with ES6, except it uses a dollar sign, which is cooler. Um, so another thing that React has is it has um, prop types, and prop types basically are what you use to specify your component contract. Um, so React has a whole bunch that are built in, and they're fine, they're totally fine, but it's like prop types that shape, and that describes like an object, and then you can say that like a shape has a name, and it has um, like, or a first name and a last name, and that's like a, a name, like that could be like a prop type. Um, but if you're looking at a component for the first time, you don't want to see like prop types that shape or prop types that array, like we want to give them more meaning. So in this example, um, I'm basically creating a custom prop type. So I'm thinking of like a search input field and having like a search results prop type, which would be a list of items that were returned from the search and then the search term that you were looking up in the first place. And then when you actually have your search component, you can specify prop types and then results and just have that prop type right there. And that makes that so much more easier to read for somebody who's just coming into this for the first time. So you know that this component is expecting results and results are of type search results prop type. And then you can, if you want, go look that up. So then in render, that's where like things get really tangly and gnarly. That's where like the DOM just gets like crazy and, and a lot of people use JSX. I actually don't use JSX. Um, I prefer not to just because, uh, you know, again, with CoffeeScript, like, just moving away from having, like, closing brackets everywhere and having to think about those things, when you remove, like, having to think about those things, you end up thinking more about the problems that you're actually trying to solve. Um, so in this case, all of our little um, image components um, on our web service, they actually have this little squiggle, and then as soon as the image is actually loaded into the DOM, basically, it, like, fades in. So like the render function for, for that component is pretty simple. And this is a component we use everywhere. We use it over and over and over again. So just like boiling things down to like the simplest state they can be. So you can see that there's a squiggle component, and that's actually just SVG. Um, and then there's an image. And the image is using images loaded to do some 
uh, image state. And then we can actually make this even simpler. Like, you know, we have some like image loading stuff going on. We can actually simplify and we can just create, um, extract out dom.image and create like image and then use that everywhere. So yeah, I try to keep my DOM render functions as small as possible so that like all of my um, React component uh, like line sizes are like super small. Kind of like, I can't remember his name. Is it Beeper? Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then something else we've been thinking about a lot. So, you know, we have, um, we have the, the view business logic. We have our templates. Um, inline styles is like totally like a hot topic right now. I had to put in Carly, uh, code in Carly with a K, double Ks, because she's so hot right now. Um, but yeah, like thinking about what does it mean to have our styles in line with our components as well, because like the one place where we get stuck now debugging React components is like having to actually go back to our stylist files and like figure out where things are wrong and looking at one, looking at the other. So we've been trying out using inline styles in our components, um, and React does offer some like nice things for doing inline styles. Like you don't have to specify the unit; it does that for you. A um, little bit trickier with response to web design, but um, longer conversation. And it gives you warnings on incorrect style names. So there's like a few niceties. I'm not 100% sold on this yet, but it is something that I think is compelling, especially if you think about like you know component-driven web app design. And then, yeah, like to that regard, we've like totally been taking everything and putting it into React. So like our SVGs are all in React. And we've been playing around with like injecting SVG files by like actually extracting um, what we want and then piping it in here. But what's nice about this is that we can just use these SVG components in our React components, and that stuff isn't hidden away from the component. So if there's like a giant icon that we're using in a button, that's like right there and not hidden in CSS somewhere. So it's kind of nice to keep everything together. Keep it in the family. Um, so yeah, expressiveness in the framework, um, you know, using CoffeeScript uh, and ES6, we'll probably move to that, I'm sure, sometime this summer. Um, Destructuring, uh, breaking components down super tiny, custom prop types. Um, but that brings us to tools. And in case you guys didn't know, it's 2015. And our frameworks can be smart and they can help us out already. So if I like break a component contract, it should be able to tell me that. <laughs> and if I break server-side rendering, it should be able to tell me that too. And if I totally bust the virtual DOM by, de -duping, by duping keys, it should also be able to tell me that. Um, again, like this all goes back to that point of like, let's focus on the experiences and not on like banging our heads on these, these like rules that our frameworks, frameworks have put in place for us. And React's actually really good at, at doing that. It has a ton of warnings built in. Um, yeah, it's kind of like pair programming with the makers of React. They're kind of annoying sometimes. They're like so annoying, actually. Sorry. <laughs> you get these, you're just like, no. But it's helpful. It's way better than like, you know, just diving into the console and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so one interesting situation is right before we, we shipped our main web product, uh, we had this Im image resolution difference. We had just like thrown up a CDN, and we were expecting to get a certain resolution of images from the server that was different than the client, so it was totally busting server-side rendering, um, basically doing like an extra render after the, the client-side JS kicked in. It was super annoying. And uh, that was a place where like React DevTools totally saved us. Also, they have um, some Chrome dev tools, so you can basically um, inspect everything that has to do with the React uh, state, props, and component lifecycle right in dev tools. That's pretty helpful sometimes. Um, so that brings me to more tools like Webpack and also using this with coffee. But it's just really like, easy to read and kind of figure out what's going on. Um, and again, like thinking about like a new developer coming into your project, um, it's kind of great that like, like DevTools source map, that turns on source maps. Um, cache true, that enables caching of Webpack and memory. So Webpack is like Browserify, um, or a competitor to Browserify. Although it actually has support for Browserify as well, so it's kind of weird. They like each have their own like loader that supports the other, which is like a weird, um, I don't know, relationship. They're not really in competition, is what I'm trying to say. And then if you want you know, to load CoffeeScript files, all you have to include is the coffee loader. So it's, it's pretty like, straightforward. The documentation's 
not superb, um, but if you can find a good, good Webpack file in GitHub, um, it's like I've really been enjoying it. And mostly because it allows us to use React Hot Loader, which is basically like live reload um, for React. But um, it, it doesn't refresh the page, which is kind of nice. So you can just tweak them in real time. And again, like not an expressive language thing or a framework thing, but just an expressive like development thing. Like it's so nice to be able to get it in and just change things like that on the fly. So yeah, better dev tools is <laughs> less time stressing and more time expressing. I mean that. Um, so let's get to server and beyond. We focused on the client so far, framework and tools, but what does it actually mean to like build out our whole web app? So, oh no, the Kool-Aid man is like pretty cropped. Anyways, I wanted this to be a place where you could like imagine your own Kool-Aid. So whatever Kool-Aid you're drinking, like think of it here. <laughs> this is mine, um, except it's missing stylus, which should be here. And yeah, um, we've talked about CoffeeScript, Webpack, React. Um, now let's quickly touch on Node, Streamline, Express, and React Router. And I'm Canadian, so I'm allowed to use the Mounties. But um, what does it mean to actually do um, isomorphic apps for expressive development? What I mean here is, um, first starting out in our web app, like there's a lot of like working closely with like the backend team, and they're great. I like them dearly. But um, it's nice to not switch uniforms. Like working on an isomorphic app, having server-side rendering just gives us more freedom to own the, the whole web app as it is and, and kind of do what we want, which is great. And server-side rendering with React is super straightforward. You literally just render to string your app and you pass in any props it needs. And then <laughs> we were a backbone app before we were a React app and uh, we had two routers. Our rout router code was totally duped. So in Express, we had a whole bunch of routes and then we were using Backbone's router on the client. Um, so it was basically like having two different traffic jams that we were like trying to orchestrate. And they each needed the same things, but they were each kicking in at different times. And like what we really want is like, <laughs> not quite this guy, because he's like super annoying, but somebody like him who's like a single router who's like directing traffic. So React Router is an isomorphic uh, re um, React Router. And uh, it's actually based entirely on Ember routing. They basically claim that they just copied it and implemented it in React. And then routes are also like very, very easy to read. Um, React Router is typically declarative, so, um, but I, I busted it out of that. And uh, so here's just like an object with all of the routes. It also comes with some nice routes by default, like a not found route and a default route. And there's a whole bunch of other ones, like there's like link, which handles like right clicks and, and so on that you can use. But it's just a single route file, and then I, I basically pipe this routes file into the server um, in Express, so like basically I have all my, any special routes that I need on the Express side, and then eventually I just fall through to um, React Router by calling its main API, which is router.run. And then on the client side, when the app mounts, or basically when it's, when the DOM is finally available, um, we basically do the same thing, except this time we pass in history location, so that we get nice URLs and so on, but it's the same thing. And uh, that brings me to React Native, or what does it mean to like, you know, learn once and then have the ability you know, to transfer that and be expressive on other platforms? It's something that we're really excited about. Um, the company I work at, we have an iOS team, web team, a hardware team, so, so thinking about the future and how we might be able to like, work together is, is definitely really exciting for us. So yeah, like, this is what a React Native like, little component would look like kind of looks exactly the same as our other ones, except we're using iOS components instead of our, our best friend, the DOM. Yeah, so isomorphic React, React Native. So it allows us to keep expressing um, or writing components expressively beyond just like React Web. Um, it, it's also the server, it's also native and beyond. This is a super old photo of the Rockettes which I thought was kind of cool. So yeah, coming back to our definition, again, to me, something is expressive when it does not need a long explanation. You just get it somehow, no matter how simple or complex. And I think um, 
I think React's been working very well for us in that way. So yeah, thank you. I know that was a lot.